Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Jason Howell and I talk to CNET's Ian Schur about HB 2005, Arizona's bill that looks to the fate of app stores for Google and Apple, and of course, Epic Games' own involvement in the platform. Then Lance Ulanoff of Medium's One Zero publication answers our question, what even is an NFT? It's a non-fungible answer to a non-fungible question. Before we round things out with Alex Wilhelm of TechCrunch to talk about Square's acquisition of Tidal, the music streaming service, and of course, our stories of the week. But you're going to have to tune in to check those out. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 173, recorded Thursday, March 4th, 2021. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by ESET. ESET protects businesses worldwide with internet security products and services backed by world-class research and tech support. Get your free ESET business trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com slash twit and save 20% on ESET Protect bundles for a limited time. And by Barracuda. Hackers are always looking for the weakest link in your security configuration, especially in your email security. Barracuda's new threat analyzer tool helps you gain visibility into your particular vulnerabilities. Visit barracuda.com slash TNW. And by Uber for business. Right now, for a limited time, receive a $50 voucher when you create your first vouchers campaign and spend $200. Go to uber.com slash TNW to learn more. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I'm the other one, Jason Howell. Too, too much energy for a Thursday. Whoa. Whoa. It's it's Thursday, Thursday, <laughs> Thursday, and we've got uh, a sh- we've got a show for you. Yes, indeed. Three awesome interviews and some stories of the week coming up. But first, I feel like we've been following this beat closely, the Fortnite versus uh, big tech, you know, Apple and Google. And we've got more on this, but I'm not sure that I saw this one coming. And joining us uh, to talk about how Arizona is getting involved in this mess somehow is Ian Schur from CNET.com. Welcome back to the show, Ian. How are you doing? It's I'm doing fantastic. It's great to get you on. Thank you for carving out some time out of your day uh, to talk with us today about this. And um yeah, this one kind of took me by surprise. I guess I didn't realize that there was like legislation in the works already that might actually kind of swoop in and come to come to Epic Games um save you know saving graces, but um there's this HB 2005 or 2005 bill in Arizona that appears to be well it's passed through the house. It's and this is an amendment to that bill. Talk a little bit about like how, like, where, the, what was the germination of this particular bill or this amendment, and uh, kind of how it might impact uh, the Fortnite, uh, Apple, Google case? Yeah, it's really fascinating. Essentially, it started as a as a boring bill about appropriations, and then suddenly got hijacked into this huge debate about technology. And now, what it's become is a very partisan bill. It appears uh, about how to handle app stores. The idea behind it, essentially, is that if you have an app store and you are an app developer, right? What will happen is that if you have more than a million downloads per year, you are not subject, in Arizona at least, to how the uh, commission structure and the payment systems work. So typically, when you're on an Apple device or a Google device, if you buy something like you know a digital good, like a Fortnite skin or uh, a subscription or something like that, you go through Apple and Google's payment system. That's they charge thirty to fifty percent, uh, thirty to fifteen percent, depending on what's going on. But under this bill, if you're an Arizona-based company, it's key, and you have more than a million downloads per year, you can choose any payment processor you want. Now. That's assuming this gets passed into law, but it's a huge change. Hmm, yeah. Okay. So there is the, that assumption that it actually gets passed into law. These things yes. obviously don't take place <laughs> in, until that actually happens. 
Um, but it's fun to to think about what might happen. Uh, how did the votes on this align? It was it a kind of a, a party line sort of thing? If so, was there a certain party that was really behind it, and why? Yeah, ironically, normally you expect that this is something that you know the 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 Democrats are typically more in favor of regulation, but this time it's actually the Republicans. Uh, they are saying that Washington is sitting on its feet too, or on, on its hands too much, not on its feet, and that it hasn't really done what's needed to be done to take care of this. So they are deciding to move on it. The Democrats say, let's let the federal government figure this out. This is not our issue and stuff like that. So it's mostly, you know, it came out of the uh, committee on a party line vote mostly. Same thing with the House. I imagine that this will remain a partisan issue going through. But, uh, you know, it's got quite a bit of momentum and it's caught the country's attention, well, at least in the tech industry. Yeah, um, it's interesting to to kind of see the reversal. And I guess when I really think about it, actually, it seems to kind of play into or dial into this idea, perhaps, that, you know, on the Republican side, targeting heavily the big tech corporations yep. for a number of reasons, you know, big tech is is kind of under the crosshairs. This seems to be one great way to kind of take them out of the knees, so to speak. This would be huge if something like this went through in Arizona and elsewhere. And we can talk about that in a second. But what is uh, I mean, what would the impact be for Apple and Google um, if if this actually goes through? I mean, from a from a revenue standpoint, this would be a huge loss for them, right? Yeah, I mean, they say that that money that they collect through the commissions really helps to pay for the development of the app stores and of their software and everything like that. And, you know, there is a lot that goes into actually managing the app stores. There's a there's a whole group of people who run it. There's a ton of infrastructure. If you have a free app, you don't pay any commissions uh, unless you have in-app purchases. So there is a lot that Apple and Google give. But I think what's interesting here is that the argument that's been pushed back against is that not giving developers even a choice is a bad thing and that it's a monopolistic move. That's what Epic argues. Epic, by the way, not based in Arizona, so they wouldn't benefit mm -hmm. from this. But it, 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 this is one of those things is that when the dominoes start to move, uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they fall pretty quickly. And if this does become a law, you might start seeing other states join in, which is why I think Apple and Google are already trying to push back against it. Mm, okay, and that's really important what you just pointed out there. Um, what, you know, it's it's important to assert that directly this would not impact Epic Games. It's more kind of the the precedent that it sets for other yep. states to follow follow suit. Especially if it's passed, then other states that might not already be pursuing something similar might, you know, open their eyes and and, and think to do the same. But there are other states also following down this path, right? What are, what are those efforts like? Yeah, it's interesting. There are a couple of other states that have considered these types of bills, but they ended up not passing them. Uh, but there is a broader kind of interest among the states to start taking tech to task. And I think that's what's really important to keep in mind is that it's not just President Trump, for example, who was railing against the tech industry. It wasn't just senators in, in uh, Washington, D.C. and congressmen in Washington, D.C. who were railing against tech. This is something that's getting down to the state level. And we're starting to see that there is a lot of interest in starting to take on tech on privacy issues. Uh, we saw Illinois actually just secured one of the biggest settlements ever uh, against Facebook for privacy issues around facial recognition. And Illinois has one of the strongest facial recognition uh, laws in the country. So there's a lot going on at the state level that kind of makes it look like they're going to take the tech industry on more, at least currently, than the federal government is. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, what, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, in your in your piece that there's uh, there's lobbying efforts happening as as well. I mean, obviously Google and Apple don't I, I imagine don't, aren't aren't very happy about uh, not something like this going no. through. <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly, uh, what are they saying publicly or even through these lobbying efforts? What what is their position on this? Yeah, uh, you know they have uh, submitted testimony to the House and they have also 
made statements about it, roughly sticking to what they've said before, right? I, I, this is the same conversation we've been having now since last August with Epic, which is that the app stores are designed the way they are, that the commissions they believe are fair. And also, you may remember Apple commissioned a study by uh, a group of economists who they who said that the commission structure was actually very much in line with the rest of the industry. Now, of course, the 30% commission is something that Apple kind of started in mobile devices, so it's not a shock that it's uh, pretty in line with the rest of the industry. And they argue that commissions used to be higher before the App Store came around in 2008. So I, it's going to be interesting to see how much more they push back against this. I think that part of the problem they're going to run up against is that it's hard to argue don't give developers choice, right? Especially to a bunch of Republicans who are all about personal choice. And so I, I think that's going to be a very interesting debate going on. And I think it's going to be something that Apple and Google are going to find themselves really hard to convince people of. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now, um, you know, obviously this the the story and kind of the attention is on Fortnite, even though, like you say, it, this wouldn't directly impact uh, Epic Games with with games like Fortnite. But um, because they're not developed in Arizona, are, right? Like, do we have any examples of companies that would be directly impacted by this um, if if it were to go through? And, and maybe not even just in Arizona, but you know, Epic Games is a really easy kind of way to 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 look at this because they've made such a stink about it. But what are some other apps right. out there that would really benefit <laughs> from this? Well, I mean, you could imagine any big app. I mean, pull up your app store right now and look at the top. Well, after the show, don't stop the show. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> but you know, if you look on the on the top uh, of the app store, almost every one of them is going to be impacted by this. And especially, again, you have to keep in mind if they have uh, in that purchases, even though they're free. So Candy Crush, right? If you're yeah. thinking about uh, productivity apps, right, like Basecamp, which is actually part of the group called the Coalition for Apps Fairness, which is what kind of helped to kickstart a lot of this. They're the semi-lobbying group that's been ex created around this epic controversy. Uh, they have a bunch of people in there who could be impacted by this. And, and generally speaking, as mobile devices continue to penetrate throughout the world, I know it seems like everyone and their mother has an, a mobile device, but when you go to the developing world, not really. Um, this stuff is still, there's going to be a lot of apps that have way more users in the next five years than there are today. And I think that setting that bar at a million downloads puts a ton of apps into that list. And that's probably something that worries Apple and Google as well. Yeah, a million sounds like a lot, but really with a lot of apps out there, that's <laughs> that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's you know, that's yeah. that's pretty pretty easy uh, metric to to land. So that would really Yeah, TikTok open it up. for example has already crossed over a billion uh, downloads or 2 billion downloads last year and it came right. out of nowhere practically, right? So these things happen very very quickly. Yeah. So is yeah. So essentially, any mid-tier and and up app that's not like indie developed, small small uh, user share and everything would have the ability to do this. And that's also assuming that they would want to do this. They they might just be right. as as comfortable as anything to stick with what what they know and what's being offered uh, without any extra lift involved. So no, that's well, one uh, thing that's oh, yeah. important as well is that Apple and Google. You know, they, they they could convince the app developers to stick with them, right? They could lower the fees. Absolutely. They could do a ton of things to get oh, yeah. them to do that. So, you know, it's not like suddenly they go away. It's just that there's more choice all of a sudden. Oh, no, not more choice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> Ian, uh, really appreciate you taking time to uh, join us today and talk about this. Always love reading your work and love having you on the show. Uh, Ian writes, of course, for CNET.com. Ian, sure. If people want to follow you online, where can they find you? You, you can find me on pretty much every social network uh, under the name Ian Schur, I-A-N-S-H-E-R-R. -R. Awesome. Do that, people. Thank you, Ian. Have a great day. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Take care. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks so much, Ian. Uh, up next, a non-fungible interview about NFTs. <laughs> Probably. Nice. I, I don't really know, but hopefully our next guest can explain whatever the heck that means. But first... <laughs> I'm here to tell you that this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by ESET. 
We've been relying on ESET for years here at Twit. It offers enterprise-grade security that's easy to manage for a small business like Twit. And it has a light system footprint that never slows us down. ESET has had two exciting new developments recently. ESET has just introduced its brand new endpoint security management platform. That's called ESET Protect. And one of the main features is the new ESET Protect Cloud, which offers easy cloud-based management for businesses of all sizes with no restrictions on seat size. ESET Protect also takes security to a whole new level with new bundled products. These new bundles feature enhanced protection against ransomware and zero-day threats, plus full disk data encryption capabilities for Windows, and Mac OS. Right now, you out there can save 20% on all these new bundles. So you're not only getting the best-in-class cloud-managed protection against advanced attacks, you're also enjoying a significant discount. And who hates a significant discount? Nobody. Uh, for small businesses and MSPs, of course, there's ESET Protect Advanced, the bundle that has all the security you need along with a cloud-based management console. ESET Protect Advanced includes endpoint protection platform, cloud sandboxing for advanced threat detection and prevention, full disk encryption, and file server security on a cloud-based console. If you prefer on-prem management rather than cloud-based, though, ESET Protect also offers that option. Either way, you're going to get powerful, reliable security based on 30 years of research and innovation. You out there can get a free trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com slash twit. ESET just earned top ratings in AV Comparative's Endpoint Prevention and Response Comparative Report. In testing of nine vendors, ESET not only achieved the highest combined prevention and response score in the test, but also demonstrated outstanding overall detection and reporting capabilities. ESET earned the top rating of Strategic Leader, signifying a product that has a very high return on investment, low total cost of ownership, and exceptional technical capabilities. This is one of the most comprehensive tests of endpoint detection and response solutions and endpoint security products ever conducted by this independent testing organization. So these are incredibly impressive results. Now remember, get your free ESET business trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com slash twit and save 20% on ESET Protect bundles with this great limited time offer. Trust ESET to future-proof your business. Just go to business.eset.com slash twit. Thanks so much to ESET for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All right, if you've been on the internet in the past couple of weeks, which you probably have if you're listening to this podcast, then you may have seen or heard something about NFT, those three letters together. Uh, maybe you even heard something about non-fungible tokens, or maybe all of this is brand new to you. In any of those cases, I was incredibly curious about what has practically become a meme at this point and uh, wanted to get someone on the show to talk about NFTs, to explain this to me, to explain this to all of you and to help us better understand what's going on here. And it turns out somebody was writing about NFTs over on Medium's One Zero publication. Joining us today, Lance Ulanoff, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yes, so... Uh, I think the best thing to do is to start by explaining what a non-fungible token is and why people should care about it. Can you do that for us? <laughs> well, it's the hot new thing. You got to care about it. But uh, yeah, so um, it's related to cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, uh, and you know, the thing about digital art, right, anything in the digital space is that you can copy it pretty much endlessly, right? Um, I take a photo, I put it on the computer, I send it to you, you send it to somebody else. There are dozens of copies of it and they all have the same or zero value. But what if digital art could, an, a digital copy of a piece of art could have intrinsic value because it's considered one of a kind, or one of five, and that's it. Because every piece of art that these artists are creating, this digital art, is assigned a token on the blockchain. So it becomes rare, it becomes collectible, it becomes special, and collectors 
you know, are starting to put real money, you know, they'll put money into a digital wallet for cryptocurrency and then use that to basically invest in these collectibles, these non-fungible tokens, uh, digital art, and then they own them. And maybe the value goes up. Maybe the value goes up because the value of cryptocurrency has gone up. We've seen how um, in the last couple of years, Bitcoin's value has gone to the roof. Uh, so it takes it outside of the traditional tangible sphere. It takes it outside of the traditional um, analog currency sphere and puts it in a new space. Uh, it, it's you know, The reason I wrote my story is because I was kind of like you and maybe some other people. I just kept hearing about it, but (laughs) didn't entirely understand what everyone was talking about. Yeah, I think that that's that's exactly uh, how I was feeling about things. It was not understanding what everybody was talking about and a little bit of FOMO for sure. Uh, <laughs> wanting to 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 get in on whatever it was, whatever an NFT was. And I think even more than that, hearing some folks uh, kind of just talk, just making jokes about non-fungible this and non-fungible that. Um, so right. I immediately looked for the, you know, the Vox explainer <laughs> to try and figure right. out what was and going the, on. The, the idea that people are getting rich off of this, you know, the, the maybe the the sort of flashpoint for a lot of people was the news about Grimes making six million dollars uh, through her digital art. And it was based, it was through this system, you know, it was through Nifty Gateway, which is a site that is a clearinghouse for uh, NFTs. And uh, they have these things called drops. So when artists of note like Grimes, who's a, an electronica music artist, and also uh, the you know she's dating Elon Musk and the mother of his child, but uh, they had scheduled they were going to do this drop of her new art, which was this nymph warrior, uh, which is basically a baby wielding a weapon, uh, and. Uh, they sold and they sold almost immediately. She made all this money, $6 million. She's donating some of it to a uh, sort of carbon footprint charity. Uh, but that really kind of like, what, it, why, you know, you know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's, this is a really difficult thing uh, for people to wrap their heads around because yeah, uh, you're telling me that each piece of digital art is tied to a token. And the whole point of, of, of cryptocurrency uh, and blockchain technology is that these tokens are are immutable. They can't be. There's there's a limited number of them. There's this is a specific number, and that's it. But at the same time, I'm like, it's a piece of art I look at on the screen. What if mm-hmm. I take a screenshot of that? What, mm-hmm. you know, what does that mean? Now, a lot of this art is more than, in fact, quite a bit of what I saw. Um, it's not uh, static art. It's 3D. It's animated. It has a music. It has a music or soundtrack behind it. And Grimes obviously makes her own soundtracks, uh, so that can make it more special. But what about things like um, the moment in a basketball game? Like I've heard of of sports moments being turned into NFTs. I still can't entirely understand how that works. Um, I've seen trading cards for sneakers. Um, I've seen Pokemon style cards. Uh, I, I've just seen all sorts of stuff. And some of the art is great and some of it's not. But because there's this this sort of rush right now, the people are super excited about it. There's a lot of money flooding into it. Uh, speculation, really, uh, mm. without the sense of where we're going to be six months, a year, two years from now in the NFT space. Is it going to be something that has staying power? Is it as valuable, for example, as, you know, I have collectibles in my house. Uh, I have Star Wars collectibles, Star Trek collectibles, you know, things that I think have value. Uh, And I feel like that because it's a physical object, it'll at least hold some of that value. But I don't Mm -hmm. know how the world of digital NFT collectibles really holds a true value because the value is, of course, tied not only to what the artist has created, the quality of it and their notoriety, their position, but... Uh, the value of 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 cryptocurrency. 
And crypto, so I guess my, what I'm trying to understand here is it, what you just said right there was kind of the crux of my question is like, where exactly is this value derived from? I get it, the value of the art itself and the value of cryptocurrency. Is that the value of cryptocurrency, like the market in general, or is it a particular cryptocurrency? Like, hey, Bitcoin, like, like if you buy this, it translates to X Bitcoin, which if you sold today is worth this. Like, is it, it's not an apples to apples comparison, right? Yeah, no, I mean, there, it, Ethereum is in the mix. Bitcoin uh, is in, in is in the mix. Uh, and I know that there are other kinds of, you know, people like generate their own tokens within the, the blockchain space. And I can't even keep track. Um, I've been talking to someone about, you know, because this is not the first time that blockchain technology is being co connected to the collectible space. Because the whole thing about that is identifying what is both rare and real, right? Because in mm -hmm. a collectible, you can have fakes, counterfeits. And uh, that can be very upsetting if you think you've had, for example, uh, I, I've noted this this case of uh, people going online and they post on Twitter this, uh, maybe a poster, a Star Wars poster with Mark Hamill's signature on it. And they put it up there and they ask Mark Hamill, is this, did you do this yours? He goes, no, I've never signed that before. That's not me. And then they're, they're crushed. Now imagine if whatever you get has a token assigned to it, and that token is is basically that's the thing that says this is the real thing. Uh, so that's happening mm -hmm. in the real collectible space, and now it's happening in this space of digital art. But the, the thing that's crazy is this isn't stuff that has some intrinsic value like it was connected to a historical event, uh, a great show that we loved or something like that. It's being created right now. People are creating these NFTs right now and saying they'll have this intrinsic value later. They have, you know, they'll have, and then it's a question of what kind of uh, cryptocurrency you're connecting it to. Uh, and I don't know much about how those values go. All I know is that they've generally been going up in recent years as more speculators come in. Uh, but again, this is like another facet of a very complex diamond. Because really, in the whole crypto space, and when we talk, you know, basically a lot of us have started by talking about Bitcoin, and many of us really never quite understood it, uh, because it, it, I think for traditionalists, people who come from sort of the old world where every so much was analog, it's the most difficult thing for them to understand. This is yet another sort of, sort of thread of difficulty trying to understand why anyone would pay thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for a digital image of a sneaker that someone once wore in 2010. Yeah. And I, but I guess that's my, I draw a comparison to, you know, so when I was a kid, I would get, um, say baseball cards and, uh, there would be, you know, baseball cards from one brand and baseball cards from another mm -hmm. brand. And these days, the uh, rookie card of a player uh, from one brand might be worth a bunch of money and someone buys it. But the rookie card of another uh, brand is is worthless, is is valueless. And, and uh, Beanie Babies, uh, another example. And the the one thing is that yes there's this physical connection to this item you have this physically in in and you can grasp it and say that you know this is yours but as you pointed out you know what if you ended up buying this um beanie baby at uh a at a yard sale and it ended up being one that you know great uncle Stevenson made with his sewing machine and it wasn't actually a real beanie baby and so then it's not as it's not worth as much as you thought it was right. and I mean, what, how can we, it, isn't everything that we kind of put value in, uh, it has value because we've decided it has value. Right. I mean, yes. there are, yes. there are other rare minerals in the earth right. that could be as valuable as a diamond if we chose it to be, Look, but there's a couple we've of different chosen things the diamond there. as one. Right. There's a couple of different things that work there. You know, so provenance, right? 
you know, that uh, w- you, how do you know the history, the background, the connection of this thing to the, the supposed value? That's where the token comes in with this digital stuff, because that's how you instantly know the provenance of this. Where was it created? By whom was it created? Who was it sold from to? It can never be taken back. That's something that in the collectible world we really don't have a good sense of. And that, you know, you run into situations of people having something that turns out to be fake. We've all watched, you know, antique Antiques Roadshow and seeing the the people like oh it's it's my grandfather told me this da 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 and they're like no it's not actually that at all it was just you know it was bought at a five and dime somewhere uh, so there's that and then the question of value like assigning value to something you brought up diamonds and in my story I talk about like how people affix a value to any good and we live in a world of relative plenty like for example. Uh, we can drink pretty much as much water as we want. We have enough water uh, for us, you know, in most places. Uh, so that gives in wealthy societies that gives them the ability to value something like a diamond, because a diamond has no actual intrinsic value. It's hard, yeah. We can make pretty hard stuff, you know, synthetically now. It's pretty to look at, but is it actually as valuable to us as water? Because without water, we die. Without a diamond. Maybe you're a little bummed out. So, yeah. you know, this, the mm-hmm. question of value is is really where I started my story because I wanted to try and understand how people end up assigning these insane values to something that has no tangible entity. You can't touch it and is really being created almost on the fly. And the, the value it has is the grime says this is awesome. She created it. And here's a token that makes – that ensures that it is something that grime's – made and sold to you. Yeah. And then I guess the other thing that kind of drives up value is when you've got people bidding on these different items. So even if right. uh, a, a random artist, I was just looking at one of these NFT marketplaces and this person is just your average everyday person who had created a little bit of an animation and people liked it. And so they decided to, you know, everybody's voting on, or uh, bidding it up and then suddenly it's worth a bunch of money. And you you talk about um, value over time. I mean, do do we see that as as playing a role here? Uh, that while somebody's spending twenty thousand dollars on an NFT now uh, seems to be worth something. There's <laughs> yeah <laughs> in in a world where suddenly only the physical items you have on your person or in you know in the, in your given space are things that you can I mean it, this right. that's the thing is it's tied to electronics right I mean is is there a yeah. way to to I suppose maybe one of us needs to invent some sort of um, company that prints these <laughs> non fungible tokens then, right, into something right, to and then you like right, and you like circled back like it's a, we're all putting our photos right you know it, it goes from our our phone you know directly to to the cloud and we look at it in other cloud connected devices and we <laughs> almost never print them out. Um, yeah. And sometimes we live in fear of like, you know, what if the cloud goes down? What if I lose my backup, you know, and I don't have any physical record. And then maybe sometimes we'll print some out just to be safe. But most of us don't. Most of us are just trying to ingest our, our physical copies of stuff so we don't have to hold on to it. So we don't have to store it anymore. These things only live in the digital space. And that's probably where they'll only ever live. The question is, what happens if there's some um, massive blackout that's that lasts longer than than a week and suddenly you you start to realize that you can't access all the things you paid twenty thousand dollars for. Uh, yeah. I'm, look, I'm not, I'm not a proponent of spending that much money on any of this stuff, especially up front when we know so little about the true value of what's being done here. But I do think that there's a really interesting opportunity for upcoming artists, just like what you talked about. So I, my brother is actually a comic artist, uh, and he works on Instagram and does a lot of great comic art. He has a ton of followers. Uh, and I actually talked to him about this. I said, this seems like a thing for you because how to get people to, you know, a like on an Instagram is not going to convert to money. This is the mm-hmm. one of the first times where you can create art and make real money on the fly. And it's kind of the power of the, the community that drives it. Uh, so I think there is a real opportunity for people who are creating art and trying to make a living doing that because people say they love it, but they're not paying for it. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, I think that consumers have to be smart and, you know, 
you know, it's not like you want to rush into this and take all of your excess money and start buying NFTs. Right. Well, uh, Lance, my last question for you, any plans on uh, selling or buying any NFTs in your future as it stands? Uh, look, you know, I, I swear to you, one of the things I did is I started going down the rabbit hole on the nifty gateway to see if I could like create my own account. I mean, I've been drawing my whole life. I can create, you know, like crummy artwork. Uh, would anybody buy it? I don't know. And then I kind of was like, Oh, I have to make a video and I didn't get so, so far in it, but I, who knows, I might go back, but, uh, you know, I, I have no expectations of doing that. Uh, certainly, am I somebody who would buy any of this stuff? Not the prices that I saw. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I could buy something for – there was, look, this. I think it was the sneaker I saw, which would cost, you know, maybe, you know, like $5 in normal money and 0. 0.003 Ethereum. I'm like, yeah, but – the other stumbling block for a lot of people, including me, is setting up the wallet and knowing I have to take real money and connect it to uh, cryptocurrency. And I don't know if I'm ready to do that yet. I haven't made that move. Maybe I will in the future. We'll see. Uh, well, Lance Lenoff, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. If folks want to follow your work online, uh, where do they go to do that? All over the place. I mean, every account is under my name, Lance Yulinov. Obviously, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm on TikTok. Uh, so uh, pretty much. And of course, Medium. Uh, and so any of those are great places to follow me and see what I'm up to. Excellent. And soon to be on the Nifty Gateway as well. <laughs> Thank, you for joining we'll us, Lance. <laughs> Thank you, Lance. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Up next, you may have heard Square uh, bought or, or at least a, a majority stake in Tidal, the music streaming service. And I'm confused. So we have Alex Wilhelm from TechCrunch uh, joining us to talk about that. But first, I want to thank the sponsor of this episode of Tech News Weekly, and that is Barracuda. This episode is brought to you by Barracuda. Hackers, they're always looking uh, for the weakest link in your security you know, configuration. Email is often a really great place to go when you're looking for a weak link in, in the company's security. If you can find uh, your vulnerabilities before they do, well, you can defend against those cyber attacks before they actually happen. That's where Barracuda's new threat analyzer tool comes in. It's super useful. It's gonna, it's, it can save you <laughs> from traditional malware uh, to the latest spear phishing, uh, account takeover, conversation hijacking. Barracuda has actually identified 13 different types of email threats. The thing is, it takes several different layers of security all kind of working in concert together to protect you uh, against all 13 threat types that they've identified. If you're not fully protected, well, those cyber criminals, they are going to figure out where you are vulnerable. It's literally what they spend their time doing because the payoff is so, so high. So when they find that gap in your security, they just need to choose the right threat type and then, you know, tweak it and customize it to get into your system. Uh, that can ultimately just end up costing you millions of dollars, not to mention your reputation in the market. And here's where it gets hard with hundreds of highly targeted personalized threat variants uh, emerging every day and many different kinds of on-premises and cloud-based email systems, it can be super challenging uh, to identify your specific gaps, the vulnerabilities that are at the core of your system. Uh, and that's what the Barracuda Threat Analyzer is actually for. It's super simple. It's fast to use. You go to barracuda.com slash TNW and you can answer a few multiple choice questions just about your email security setup doesn't take very long. It's just two minutes. And the Barracuda Threat Analyzer provides a custom report that actually tells you which threat types you're most vulnerable to. And that's incredibly useful, incredibly handy. You'll get customized uh, rep recommendations on how to strengthen your defenses against those attacks. And again, it's free and it's super easy to use. So you can check it out uh, right away. Barracuda's December spear phishing report found 12% of all spear phishing attacks are business email compromise. That's actually up from 7% in 2019. And that's a lot of growth in a short amount of time shows how successful these attacks can be. Uh, not only that, according to the FBI's most recent internet crime report, business email compromise attacks 
led to over $3.5 billion in losses. Uh, <laughs> the government of Puerto Rico lost $2.6 million in a single attack last year. I mean, there's so many different examples of what's going on right now. And you need someone um, that can identify these things and beyond identifying them, protect, help you and protect you against them. So give you the information that you need to protect yourself, especially. So does your email security protect against those attacks? Well, try the Barracuda Threat Analyzer today. You can try it for free. You'll get a full report showing exactly what you need to do uh, to secure your email from those attacks. Go to barracuda.com slash TNW. That's our special URL. Tells them that you heard about Barracuda through watching or listening to Tech News Weekly. And you can find out where your hidden threats lie. That's Barracuda Threat Analyzer. Just go to barracuda.com slash TNW and check it out for yourself. And we thank the team, the folks at Barracuda for uh, sponsoring this episode of Tech News Weekly and supporting the Twit Network. All right. I, I mean, I don't normally see many things coming, uh, you know, in this regard, but I definitely didn't didn't think about like a company like Square, which is a payments company. Uh announcing a major stake investment in Tidal, which is a music streaming company. The combination there is a little baffling, and I think I'm not alone. Joining us to talk about this uh, this interesting deal is Alex Wilhelm from TechCrunch. Welcome back. Hey, hey. I uh, I, I suspected we might talk today, given this uh, relatively interesting <laughs> news item. My Twitter feed was alight this morning with uh, people's different takes, and uh, yeah. it's been a little bit of a thing to parse. But uh, yeah, I'm glad you're here to talk about it. Yeah, thank you, man. It's always great to see you, Alex. Happy to get you on. So uh, let's, I, I suppose we'll start with the deal. Um, Square CEO Jack Dorsey kind of tweeted out a lot of the details. He even specified in his tweet storm, you know, that, okay, you may be asking yourself why, what what the heck's going on here? What are the details that he laid out? So uh, up top, the deal is uh, 297 million, if my memory serves. I think this is a mostly stock deal. There could be some cash in there, and uh, it's for a majority stake. We don't know exactly how much, so it could be 50.01%, could be 75%. Uh, but the dollar amount is is known. They had to kind of talk about that. They are a public company and so forth, so sharing more information is pretty common. And uh, according to Billboard reporting, uh, the individual artists that were kind of early title partners are going to retain their ownership stake in the company. So they're going to keep kind of this broader list of, uh, of shareholders who are in the music world uh, inside the kind of square ecosystem, I suppose. So cash and stock, a lot of money. Not sure about the uh, the actual final valuation of the company, but certainly now inside of Jack Dorsey's control. Yeah, and that was kind of an, an interesting aspect of the title story is all of the artists – that are also partners and own a, own a stake in that. Why is it important that they get to retain their stake in title? Is that about kind of reputation of title as a service with the artists that are most passionate about it? What do you think that signals? Well, you know, when they brought the artists on to title, the idea was to have some buy-in from the individual, you know, musicians that kind of comprise the music that powers the world of, uh, of streaming. And I don't know exactly how well that went, but Square with its cash app could give them all kind of a larger platform. So my my general thought, and this is all very nascent, so I could end up being entirely wrong, but, you know, if you're going to have tie-ups between the consumer side of Square and, uh, and title itself, you're going to want to have ambassadors. And so if you keep these artists that are very well-known figures and keep them with some ownership in the uh, in the title business, they may be much more inclined to take part in cross-promotion or just generally being available to make both brands seem cool. And, uh, you know, I am uh, I'm officially no longer one of the kids these days. Sadly, I have aged out of that category. But I do think that star power amongst musicians does retain quite a lot of sway. So if you're Jack, you want to keep those people around. And, you know, just to be clear, one thing I forgot to say up top is that Jay-Z is going to join Square's board. So they're not just bringing the service on and then hoping to kind of put it off in the corner and leave it be. They're trying to really listen to other people that may not have been uh, as, as you know loud at the Square board level, which could make the company a bit more innovative as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. Um, Jay-Z, like you said, part of the board. Um, also, you know, Jay-Z, this is not the only – title is not the only company that he owns. I think he bought it, what, in like 2015 or something like that for a lot yeah. less than um, than this majority stake. So he's he's doing all right. Just last month, he sold 50 percent of his ownership in his champagne company, 
can't remember the name of it. I didn't write it down, but uh, I don't know if I've ever drank it. I don't know if it's any good, but uh, apparently he sold that uh, due to what he had mentioned, you know, the pandemic uh, forces, yeah. just saying pandemic's been really, really difficult on business. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, you've, you've got to do what you got to do. And so we're just kind of going with the flow. Do you like, do we know why he struck this deal right now? Is there any indication that, I mean, that that's the same force uh, applied to now to title or something different? I mean, I would be surprised if there wasn't some sort of similar thing uh, at play there. But if, if you're surprised uh, and you're listening to this, that Jay-Z is involved in so many different businesses, uh, you should listen to more Jay-Z because he said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. And he's had, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of investments across the uh, the spectrum for some time now. Uh, the yeah. Champagne Company, of course, was a famous deal that I think happened after a different Champagne Company kind of um, – said some racist stuff about uh, black Americans uh, liking their product. And so they kind of, those consumers left and then did other stuff. Um, but, you know, this deal would have made the same sense for Square, regardless of how well uh, JC's other businesses were doing. But maybe on uh, Mr. Carter's side, it, it did make more sense due to the overall damage that the music industry has seen with the lack of touring. And of course, the move mm. to streaming has uh, shaken up their revenues as well. So uh, I think your intuition there, Jason, is quite on. But I don't think they're ever going to come out and say, Wow, you know, right. we were struggling, so we sold most of this to, to Square. But I, I would be shocked if that wasn't at least partially the case. Yeah, that's, a, that's probably a good thing for them to not uh, explicitly admit uh, in the in the midst of a deal. Um, d is this a lifeboat for Tidal specifically? Like Tidal as a as a music streaming company has always kind of been, oh, and then there's Tidal. You know, <laughs> they're never yeah, right yeah, in that top sure. rung of Spotify, Apple Music, whatever. They're always kind of like dot, 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 and Tidal. Um, like, I don't know, is Tidal happy with this? I mean, obviously you don't know that, but um, just given what we know about Tidal and its performance, is this is this a good deal for them? You know, generally speaking, if I was going to be offered equity in one of two companies, either Tidal or Square, I'm going to go ahead and probably choose Square, given the company's amazing growth in the last couple of years and just the appreciation of its, uh, its valuation as a public company. So, you know, lifeboat is uh, a strong phrase. I, I might say a creative partnership. Like this is going to be something okay. that could be very good for Title. But here's the thing. If we had sat down, Jason, you know, two years ago and said, will Title make it all the way to 2021? I bet we would have said, eh, probably not. You know, they're probably yeah, going to get crushed true. under that's the true. weight of Apple Music and, uh, mm. and Spotify. And at the same time, SoundCloud, a famously unprofitable bit of the music world, also still alive. These services seem to be kind of hard to kill, which is interesting to me. I wouldn't have guessed that that was going to be the case. So I wouldn't say Lifeboat uh, title was still floating uh, without this. But, you know, if you're not going to be the biggest player in the market, having a very large sibling in the broader business community to leverage, to, you know, use capital from and so forth could be great for them. And so for title, I, I think this is nothing but a win. And it's for more money, as you mentioned, than I think we would have guessed. Yeah, absolutely. Title was in a boat. Don't get me wrong. It's just they had one oar. So they were kind of going right. around in circles and was like, you know what? We want to go straight. The tiller was broken. Yeah, the mast had a creak in it. So it, yeah, this is a much – they got picked up by a yacht called Square. And uh, they're going to be able to go <laughs> yes. a lot faster with more direction is how I think this looks like. Yes, nailed it. All right, we found the perfect analogy. Um, okay, so you said this morning your your Twitter was going uh, uh, was lit up on fire with people with opinions. Like, how how are people responding to this news? I have to imagine analysis on this is all over the place, just considering the two entities involved. Oh yeah, I mean it's a complete mess, including from yours truly. I mean when I when I first saw this, I had heard a, a a rumor of this a little bit ago and had dismissed it as silly, you know, probably title trying to make some noise to get other people interested in them, whatever. And then it happened, and so my first reaction was, "Wait, what?" And I literally just tweeted out that because I just I had nothing else to add to the moment. Uh, and then I read Jack Dorsey's Twitter. Uh, what do you call them now? Tweet storm? Is that still the phrase of art? I, mean, I don't know. That's what I used. It could be dated. Thread? Thread? A thread. I'll take yeah, it. it's probably yeah, more yeah, of a yeah, thread yeah. now. Yeah. I read I read Jack's thread. And uh, I got to say, the deal has a lot of benefits possibly for Square. So here's here's the, the bullish take as far as I can make it. Uh, Square is worth $106 billion. So spending a couple of hundred million on title is a fraction of a single percent of the company's market cap. This was effectively free. Given that Square has appreciated so much in value in the last year, they're really just spending money that the market gave them. So there's not an enormous cost. Uh, you get Jay-Z on the board. Again, I think his perspective could be very, very good for the company. He's, you know, I mean, 
not just a genius, but he's a kind of a creative visionary. And having that type of person on your board, my gosh, how could that be a net negative for a consumer facing business to a large degree? And also, I was surprised at how big Cash App had become. I'm a I don't use Cash App. I'm more of a Venmo boy myself. But apparently, Cash App had 36 million <laughs> monthly actives in December of last year. That's quite a lot. And so if you can think of some crossovers between Cash App, uh, buying music, supporting artists, business models, there's probably enough of an overlapping circle there that you can make the case that for Square, this could be pretty positive. So, uh, you know, I was initially skeptical. I think I think everyone was in kind of a snap decision. But now, sitting back a little bit, with the price being what it is, with what they got for it, uh, I'm very curious to see where they want to go. So I'm, I'm no longer negative. I think I'm, I'm, I'm neutral, Jason, but I'm curious. Are, are you positive, negative? How do you feel about this? If um, I could quickly interject, yeah, just uh, just to go along, and then Jason, you should totally answer that because uh, Alex, I just wanted to say your experience was it, it mirrored my experience perfectly. I first heard this and went, "What?" And then I looked at Jack's thread and read through what he was saying. And suddenly it made sense the way that they talk about um, about uh, title kind of fitting with the 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 cash brand in the sense that um, or, or the square brand in the sense that Square uh, gave individuals the uh, the tools they needed to become a business and to yeah. start small businesses. That's the same thing that Title is doing with artists who want to become a business and those kind of the ethos there, I guess, kind of uh, lined up and suddenly it started to make sense to me. And I think that I'm even past neutral into into nodding my head a little bit territory. Okay. And no, I, just, I like that. I, I can't I can't help but throw in also, I mean, any any relation to Beyonce is immediately going to help you in anything that I care about. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I don't I don't want to make the Bayhive mad. I'm not as big of a Beyonce fan as I'm supposed to be. Um, but I, I will say that you know Beyonce and Jay-Z are internationally famous megastars for a reason. It's because they're incredibly talented mm -hmm. and have had their finger on the pulse of culture and in fact have been, you know, driving forces in, you know, kind of cultural change for so long now. Why would you not want them to be around your consumer brand, right? It just, it just makes, yeah. uh, I, I, I get that. And for 0.2% of your market cap, th that feels cheap. You know, it feels yeah. inexpensive to me. Um, I, I, but on a product level, I'm very curious to see what comes out of this. But you're right, Square did take small businesses and brought them into a more uh, IRL digital economy. And uh, I think we've seen Square also do similar work online and we've seen an enormous push for general digitization amongst all companies. So why not bring the musical world as best you can into the Square world and uh, and see if there's a good union there? It's uh, it, it's also fun. And when's the last time we got to talk about something fun? So uh, totally. I, I also enjoyed that. Right. Of it. Right. Yeah, that's part of the reason why why it uh, it kind of stuck out for me and why I reached out to you because you are fun, especially when it comes to uh, to topics like this, kind of hashing through it. I'm I'm actually pretty positive about this. I think okay. I, I completely agree with what what you both have just said. Um, you know, Jay Z, Beyonce, the people behind this. I feel like they they do have their obviously they have their fingers on the pulse of the music industry. They're incredibly business business savvy. And yes. so I don't know that this would necessarily be a deal that they're just taking to, to like scramble and, and, and run or anything like that. There could be some really unique things that come out of this deal that, I, you know, that we just don't see or know what that looks like as an as a as an incredibly independent artist that makes next to zero money off of my music. If they end up, you know, doing some sort of partnership that enables uh, musicians you know, uh, to, to make more of a, a market push for themselves or have more of a presence or something along those lines, that could be really cool to kind of see, yeah. you know, how if, you know, maybe they redefine that space uh, to a certain degree. Um, so I'm curious to see from a product standpoint, what they're able yeah. to turn this into. Uh, one, one tiny thing about that. And then I want to talk about one other acquisition, but uh, on the music front, I am almost annoyed with how little money I pay Spotify for the value that I get out of it. And so to mm -hmm. me, there seems to be a dramatic imbalance between what I'm paying in, which is, I don't even know, 10, 15 bucks a month, whatever. And, you know, listening to several hundred hours of music every month, I should be paying more. And I would love to have the ability to give more money to the artists that I, that I really depend on the most as a heavy metal fan. Uh, some of the bands that I really enjoy and really enrich my life, um, are pretty small and the streaming world yeah. doesn't really work that well. The economics aren't there for smaller bands. So if they can do stuff in that direction, I'll be a big fan. Um, but uh, if you guys think about Square as a company that makes deals, they did buy Caviar back in the day. 
Mm -hmm. And people were very perplexed by that. Why would Square get into the food delivery game? And eventually they sold that to DoorDash for like 400 million or whatever it was. Uh, but this is not their first foray into experimentation via acquisition. So there is some precedent for this. And, um, you know, Square shareholders can't get that mad because it's just not that much money. They didn't spend $5 billion on this, right? You know, a couple hundred right. million dollars at their scale is just, I, I don't want to say pocket change because it's dismissive, uh, but it's pocket change. Yeah, totally. Uh, great deal. And actually, as as I was listening to you talking about this just now, I was reminded of the topic of the previous interview, NFTs, non-fungible, uh, was tokens. it transaction? Tokens, sorry. Non-fungible tokens. And wonder, and also Square's kind of investment in crypto and, yes. you know, all of these things kind of converging at once. And then that, you know, coupled with maybe an artist driven, ar artist empowering platform that title could create in combination with all this stuff. Then you have something that's really forward kind of future thinking from a from an artist perspective, from driving the, the music industry and giving, um, you know, maybe artists that don't have an insane following, like some of the heavy metal metal bands that you listen to, they're smaller followings, but they're really passionate, empowered uh, fan base can actually yeah. support them in a meaningful ways outside of the traditional, well, you know, X amount of, of people streamed my music on Spotify and I got paid the this the, this number of pennies for it. Yeah. You know, there for, could be something sure. really exciting there. So I, the NFT world is, is sufficiently nascent to me as well that I don't have a very uh, strong perspective about what could come out of the union of of crypto music rights and uh, a, a tr transaction powerhouse like Square yeah. is uh, across a number of categories. But if there is a center point of those three distinct circles, this is the only company that I can think of that is properly set up to leverage it. So if you do believe in that bull case, you're probably a big fan of the deal because Spotify doesn't own a lot of crypto assets. It doesn't have a consumer crypto business. Square does, you know, Apple music. I mean, can you imagine Apple being that forward looking, please? Hmm. So this is the company that, that might be able to pull it off. And, um, I, I will stand this only if it supports the artists and not just the broader music industry, because people like the fine Jason Howell do deserve, uh, more remuneration for their fine guitar playing and singing, uh, than they currently get. <laughs> Uh, you, I will uh, put the check in the mail, Alex. Thank you very much for saying that. <laughs> 74 cents, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Wilhelm writes for TechCrunch. Uh, and you can find Alex on Twitter. It's really easy. It's just at Alex. Lucky dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, us three are always on Twitter. So I feel like all the three of us should just like open like a cafe on twitter.com because where else do we go uh but there a real pleasure guys thanks for having me and uh, i'll just say i hope more fun deals like this come because it's really fun to not just be talking about like enterprise SaaS for once yes yeah totally agree <laughs> thank you alex have a wonderful day thank you for joining us today we'll talk to you soon thank you both be safe all right Goodbye. take care all right up next it's time for our stories of the week but before that i want to tell you about uber for business that's right, Uber for business. It can be hard to find simple and effective ways to keep employees engaged and customers happy. It's especially challenging when face-to-face -face interaction is limited. If you're trying to find a way to stand out to your customers or make your employees feel extra valued, Uber for business is exactly what your business needs. You trust Uber as a way to request rides and order meals from restaurants you love. But did you know, I personally didn't until this, that Uber has a platform designed specifically for businesses? Over 160,000 companies, wow, use Uber for business to improve customer and employee satisfaction. Are you having a hard time getting people to show up or stay engaged in virtual team meetings or events? Well, with vouchers from Uber for business, you can add $20 to their personal Uber accounts so they can easily order meals through Uber Eats before the meeting. So just think about that. It's like, okay, we've got this meeting later today. Go ahead and uh, order whatever food you want for dinner and you'll be able to enjoy that while the meeting is is going on. If you want to make your customers love your business even more, well, then offer them a voucher for a free meal or ride when they make their first purchase or spend a certain amount of money. Uh, Leo had a good idea that if you go uh, buy a car, 
you could offer a voucher to get you to the the car place so that you can pick up your car and then leave again. And I had the idea of what think about the times whenever you have to go to the mechanic and you you know you drop your car off and then you have to arrange for a ride home or the the company offers some sort of shuttle service. Even better, a simple Uber uh, voucher could be there for you. Yeah. Any company can sign up for free and immediately start delivering extra value to the people who matter most to their business. Vouchers are simple to send and to redeem. Your business has total control over who gets them, when they expire, and what portion of the ride or meal you want to cover. Vouchers are shared via email or text, and they can be redeemed with a single tap. And best of all, you only pay for rides they take or meals they order. Right now, for a limited time, receive a $50 voucher when you create your first voucher campaign and spent $200. Go to uber.com slash TNW to learn more. That's uber.com slash TNW. U-B-E-R dot com slash TNW. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks so much to Uber for Business for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. Jason Howell, what is your story of the week? Prepare yourself. Kind of sticking in the musical realm and also the artificial intelligence realm. I it's it's a topic that I find endlessly fascinating. That intersection of AI and creativity. I love it. I talk about it on the show all the time when I get the opportunity. Yesterday on this week in Google, Leo put forward a story about an AI that is essentially working with piano recordings in a very creative way. So it's an AI created by Massive Technologies, Canadian company. And it was originally designed uh, to develop an AI-powered virtual piano teacher uh, with the idea being that it could be a, a nice aid for students who are actually learning how to play. So they created this AI that can analyze any recording of a piano I imagine that, you know, a clear recording of a piano so that it can get all the frequency response and everything. And then it breaks it down into the individual uh, musical notes, the components, the timing, all that needed to recreate the composition in digital form. So I kind of imagine, you know, that the AI is listening to this recording and creating a piano roll or a MIDI kind of sheet of some sort to like uh, notate, you know, where the notes are and where they stand in time and all that kind of stuff. Then the AI imprint is actually applied to a 3D rendering of a piano uh, with virtual hands over the top that actually wow. mimic where the, where those hands go and what notes they press as the recording plays back. And <laughs> what you end up with is a super realistic recreation of the performance. Now, what you're looking at right now, so there's two different videos in this article. The second video is, is crazy. Basically, it's a recreate. Yeah, so the one that you were already on. So go, go back to the one that you are already on. Let's show that one. This is a piece written in 1919 by a Russian composer named Sergei Rashmaninov. I hope I'm pronouncing his name. If you'd put up the audio for a second. <laughs> okay. What? So, all right. So it sounds like noise. But here's the yeah. thing about this. He recorded this piece to piano roll, which was a way to kind of like document the piece for the future. Back in 1919, he wrote and composed this piece and was able to play it at this speed somehow. I don't know how the heck that happens. Uh, what? It's basically impossible for anyone to play now. But what you get to see is just how crazy the hands are on the piano based on how he wrote it, right? It's next to impossible for a human to play. Supposedly, he was able to play it. Now, if you go back up to the video that's above this one, pause that one before you do. And uh, this this was the one that was shown on This Week in Google. The video shows the piano playing uh, just different uh, piano pieces from different sources. For example, right, right now we're seeing a Tom and Jerry cartoon where a concerto was, or concerto was being played. And you can kind of see the how right. the animation on the left. On the right, that's not real, right? R on the right, that's not real. That's AI uh, composited with um, with 3D rendering of someone playing the piano. So it's taking the cues of the AI and then applying it to these virtual hands. And <laughs> what you end up with, blowing. isn't it, it blows me away. This is the movie Soul and the piano performance that was animated frame by frame but with multiple animators probably took forever by animators, the AI recreation was done in three seconds off of raw audio. <laughs> Good God. So it's just, 
I, I think it blows me away that they can do this because all these AI and creativity stories do that for me. It totally does it for me. Um, but just that it, if it's this good now, it's going to continue getting better. And just taking the, the soul example and the amount of human hours to like recreate what it needed in order to animate that scene then you have an AI like this that can just pummel it out in three seconds, which is not to say they that that's have a hired perfect replication. <laughs> it, it's just going to save a lot of time. It's going to open up, yeah. you know, all all new avenues. Um, so I don't know. It's I, I'm fascinated by this stuff. I love it. I, I'm blown away. Uh, I'm truly blown away. This is incredible. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. Technology. It's neat. <laughs> wow. Um, it's also not neat at times. Yeah. And yeah. the story that I want to talk about also over on Vice uh, Motherboard is uh, about a new program uh, called Talon. Um, so there's a, a company that you may not have heard of, and it seems to be that that's kind of the point. The company is called Flock, and Flock creates surveillance cameras uh, that can be networked together and uh, their whole purpose, it seems to be kind of the ring doorbell, but for the uh, law enforcement marketplace, kind of first and foremost. There are some of these cameras in uh, other situations, but they are particularly suited to uh, law enforcement. So, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this. These uh, cameras are sold to law enforcement, to homeowners associations, to businesses. And what they do is they automatically record when a non-resident vehicle drives into a community and then can alert police to cars that are on a hot list. So the idea here is that all of these cameras are constantly looking at license plates. And if a license plate doesn't belong um, according to the community's database in the community, then people can be notified that there's a license plate that's in the community that doesn't belong there. And then if the car's license plate is on a, quote, hot list, then uh, it will also notify police. Um, the Talon Network offers up to, this is from the article, 500 million scans of vehicles a month. 500 million Whoa. scans of vehicles each month. Um, wow. And then it, it turns out that more than 500 police departments in more than 1,000 cities are using the Talon network. Um, police, so, so th again, these can be purchased by homeowners associations, by businesses, by law enforcement. Uh, specifically from law enforcement, they've purchased flock cameras that they install outside of uh, Burger King, Lowe's, and some other businesses, um, as well as certain communities. So there are quite a few communities in different places that are using these cameras to essentially keep tabs on um, on residents and non-residents. And uh, what, what the company says it's setting out to do is to, quote, give your neighborhood peace of mind, unquote. Uh, they hope to eliminate nonviolent crime across the country. And they do that by working at the neighborhood level and every police department throughout the country. And it sounds like uh, quite a few, 500 million scans, 500 police department, more than 500 police departments, and they are in more than 1,000 cities. It says, traditionally license plate reader cameras have been expensive. Uh, Flock has some inexpensive or less expensive and solar powered options that cost $2,500 annually. So that's completely opened up the the uh, marketplace to uh, more people because traditionally those things have been too expensive and prohibitive for individuals or, or communities to purchase with a $2,500 annual cost uh, worked into the um, homeowners association's dues, then you can see how that starts to make more sense. It says, our, if our average private customer has two cameras... Um, it's a one-way-in, one-way-out cul-de-sac. This technology has existed for a long time. It's just never been widely available. And now whether you're a community of 20 homes or a community of 2,000 homes, you can, afform, uh, you can afford rather the best-in-class crime prevention cameras. Um, so, of course, uh, you know, there's the, the good of it uh, that 
there's a, a way to kind of keep a neighborhood what is arguably safe uh, by, I guess, knowing who is and isn't there. And then there's the bad of it, which is um, concerns about uh, privacy and the implications there and, you know, where this data is stored, how long it's stored, who has access to it, for how long they have access to it, what law enforcement has access to versus what uh, residents have access to, and so on and so on and so on. Um, I think the most wild thing about this, and it's a very, it's a really good piece by Joseph Cox, um, and very detailed, um, is the relative, um, obscurity or, or just all around kind of lack of knowledge that we've had about this company called flock. Uh, this was mm -hmm. my first time hearing about it and to hear that they are doing 500 million scans of vehicles a month and I'd never heard of the company. That was a little concerning. I'll be honest, uh, that I hadn't heard of this thing. So yeah. 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 This is, this is crazy. I mean, there's definitely the the privacy aspect of, you know, all of this data being stored and, and controlling that and everything. But I also think about unfair targeting of people. Like, I don't know who, yeah, where, where that, where that line is drawn. Like I, I could just see people being targeted. Like, like I automatically kind of go to the Netflix or sorry, not Netflix next door kind of model where there are a ton of people on next door targeting people for, you know, flagging people as an intruder or someone who wants to rob my home or whatever, when that's really not the case, let's say it just kind of exposing, you know, whatever kind of layer of, of racism or, you know, fear that they might have about someone for maybe not the, the most sound reasons, let's say. And I, I can't help but think that something like this kind of feeds into that, right? It feeds into this mm -hmm. idea that it, it, on a neighborhood level, we are the ones to best protect our neighborhood and like protect, you know, being this like, I don't know, like like heavily armed word. And I don't mean that like yes. heavily armed as in like, like guns or whatever, but like, I don't know. There's something about that, that kind of reaction that is icky to me. And I don't like Absolutely. It. And I think that that's the big thing here is, um, is so there's a, there's a concept called mean world syndrome. And, yeah, yeah. uh, th this is, this is an incredibly important, um, phenomena that has, has come to be due to the internet, due to mass media, uh, in the way that, um, so it used to be that bad, I mean, bad things happen all the time, always, regardless yeah, always of, of what's happening. Uh, bad things have always happened and bad things uh, if you look at the the rates, bad things we estimate used to happen quite a bit more in the before times of the internet and mass media. Um, but because of the way that we are all interconnected and we can get this information immediately, um, and we are inundated with this information, uh, there's uh, the concept of mean world syndrome, meaning that we have access to information that tells us about every gritty, gruesome thing that happens all over the world if we want to. And in many cases, some of the most shocking stories end up becoming something that you hear about, uh, regardless of whether you want to hear about them. And because of that, it, it starts to engender the belief that the world is meaner than it used to be that now in this world that we live in, it's meaner and we have to do mm -hmm. our best to protect ourselves from it. Uh, but statistically speaking, the world is not as mean as it once was because of the interconnectivity that has uh, resulted in folks not being able to get away with some of those things that they used to get because we are more knowledgeable about these things. Um, yeah, true. And so it, it, what's weird, what, what's kind of strange about that is it's sort of kind of over it, it's kind of relapped, I guess, in the sense that um, all of these companies who are, I mean, we have to remember they're companies. They are, uh, you know, capitalistic organizations that want to make money. And whether it's a security system or a uh, security camera or um, a, an app that wants you to be suspicious of your neighbors, or in this case, license plate reading cameras, the best way to sell these is through fear. It's not through any other thing but fear. That like how else if there was no fear then these companies would not 
need to exist. And so they are, they, they have to, in order to continue to exist, they have to encourage that fear and they have to convince you that you need to have what you were just talking about, Jason, that sort of, uh, we have to protect ourselves model. And that is what leads to, you know, kind of even more of those, uh, that, that negativity kind of building up and making it even worse and leads to more surveillance and mistrust, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it's insidious and it's something that, you know, we all have to be, I think, aware of the way that it affects us. Um, but per I just, it's particularly worrisome, irksome, concerning when it's, from a company that you barely have heard yeah. of. And then suddenly you hear that they're in all of these places uh, across the United States. And uh, Vice has, you know, emails um, of, of police officers and police chiefs kind of uh, spousing the, you know, the, the brilliance of these systems. And yeah, that, I think that's the biggest thing is like, what we don't know is kind of what's worrisome about all of this and what other companies are uh, these different departments working with and how are they collecting information. And then again, you don't know what information is being stored where and how and why and for how long. And that's what really I think is, is bothersome about it. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> and And I also look at this and think of, Think of kind of the stories that we've heard in the past, however many years, you know, in recent memory, like the last five years of like the surveillance state of, of China and like the, the kind of the, the depth of that surveillance, the level of surveillance happening there. And often, you know, thinking, looking at that and, and looking at it through the lens of, oh, but that's that's not happening here. So everything's all right. But, you know, inch by inch. We get closer and closer to this, and this is just one one other domino in that line of dominoes that, I don't know, just kind of feels like it's creeping us closer and closer to something that isn't good. So, uh, well, that that is the cheery end of this episode of <laughs> Tech News Weekly. Uh, we publish this show every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. That's our show play, uh, page on the web. That's where you can find all the ways to subscribe, audio, video, jump out to YouTube, subscribe there, smash that like button, whatever you want to do. We appreciate it as long as you watch or listen. Absolutely. You can also follow us on social media. We are at Twit on Twitter, at Twitch.tv on Instagram, at Twitch Talk on TikTok. Um, I am at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social media networks, so you can find me there. Uh, and of course, check out Smart Tech Today, the Smart Home and Internet of Things podcast. Our episode will uh, record live later today, as well as iOS Today, uh, which I do with Rosemary Orchard, all about your iOS gadgets, uh, iPhone, iPad, et cetera, et cetera. What about you, Jason? Well, you can find me on Twitter at Jason Howell. And then um, I just published yesterday an episode of Hands on Tech all about comparing the Galaxy Buds Pro earbuds against the Jabra Elite 85Ts. They're two very similar in so many ways uh, earbuds between the 200 to 230 dollar price range, so a little pricey, but they both have active noise cancellation, and they're both really good. So I decided to pit them against each other and pick one at the end and say this is the one that I would choose between the two. Ooh. So go to twit.tv/hot. It's episode 131, published yesterday, and you can see my review there. A uh, big thanks to everyone who helps us do this show each and every week. That's John Ashley at the studio. That's Burke. Uh, at the studio as well. And that's you, because without you, we would have no one to do this show for. So thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in to another show here on the Twit Network. If you are a fan of home automation, Internet of Things, and all things smart technology, you should check out my podcast, Smart Tech Today. I do it with Matthew Casanelli, and we have so much fun talking about all the latest news for all things smart tech. 